so it's two now. Okay. I think so we have. We, we can start. Yeah. We can yeah. start. Aldamita, we can start. Yes. Yes, sir. So good, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome. Uh, I welcome all of you to this uh, webinar being uh, conducted by <clears throat> ISA um, on uh, the <clears throat> global impact of biotech crops, economic and environmental effects, 1996 to 2018. <clears throat> My name is Ram Kaundinya. I'm the Director General of the Federation of Seed Industry of India. Um, we have uh, um, all the research-based seed companies and biotech companies as members of our association. Uh, I invite uh, uh, all of you, all the participants to this webinar. <clears throat> you know, this is an interesting subject on which we have uh, always heard many webinars and many viewpoints. So I think uh, this is also an occasion and an opportunity to put forward some of the correct positions on the technology. Um, there is a Q&A button and a chat button. Q please post your, uh, during the course of the seminar, if you have any questions, please post them on the Q&A button and we will try to answer as many questions as possible towards the end. <clears throat> please keep all the microphones on mute so that we are not disturbing the speakers. We have a very eminent panel today and very good speakers. So we hope to have some very interesting uh, talks by them and uh, also good discussions. <clears throat> so please keep your microphones on mute when you are not speaking. Uh, selected questions will be raised during the course of the meeting. There will be a, a question and you will be asked to answer the question. So that uh, will happen uh, a couple of times during the course of the seminar. So please do participate in that poll, what we call the poll, right? So <clears throat> let me straight away get into the panel. Um, we have, um, and I will go in the order of the presentations. So I will first introduce Dr. Almedita, uh, Dr. Rodora Almedita is the director of Global Knowledge Center and the Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia Center of uh, the International Service for Acquisition of Agri Biotech Applications. She is based in Philippines. Uh, she leads the development and publication of the annual global status of commercialized biotech GM crops for our what are called as ISA briefs. Uh, she coordinates the activities of ISA's biotechnology information centers in 15 countries and uh, capacity building activities on biotechnology and biosafety in Southeast Asia. She is a member of the technical advisory team of the DA Biotech Program Office, uh, with a board member of the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines and editor-in-chief of the Philippines Journal of Crop Science. Um, Dr. Almedita holds a PhD in botany from Purdue University, USA, and a postdoctoral fellowship at Albert Ludwigs University, Germany, on golden rice. So her work in Germany was on golden rice. So we are keenly looking forward to your talk, Dr. Almedita, and now I hand it over to you. Yeah, we can, pro uh, it's okay. We can move to, to Graham. So you will come back later? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's have, um, I think by the time um, um, Dr. Aldemita sets right her presentation, uh, we will have uh, the presentation of Dr. Graham Brooks. Uh, Graham Brooks is a well-known name uh, to many people uh, also in India because of the studies he has been doing on the impact of the technology. He is an agricultural economist and a consultant with more than 30 years experience of examining economic issues relating to the agricultural and food sectors. He is a specialist in analyzing the impact of technology policy changes, the regulatory impact. He has, since the late 1990s, undertaken a number of research projects relating to the impact of agricultural biotechnology and written widely on this subject in peer-reviewed journals. This work includes frequent updates of 
a global economic and environmental impact of gm crops report the impact of insect resistant maize in spain and herbicide tolerant soybeans in romania the impact of gmo labeling and gmo avoidance in europe the economic impact of gmo zero tolerance legislation in the us eu the cost to the us economy of failure to embrace agricultural biotechnology the economic impact of biosafety le legislation in turkey and studies of the potential impact of using crop biotechnology in the ukraine russia thailand indonesia and vietnam so uh, graham brooks uh, it's uh, over to you uh, for your presentation thank you thank you Okay, are we functioning on the technology? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Good, for you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd first of all like to thank uh, ISA for inviting me to present to you this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to present to you in the next 20 to 25 minutes is uh, our 14th annual review of the impact of GM crop technology around the world. Um, we have been undertaking this work now for about 15 years and uh, the material I'm going to present to you today is the latest update. Um, in relation to my experience, um, I'm an author or a co-author now of more than 30 papers on the impact of this technology around the world. That's 30 papers in peer-reviewed journals. And for those of you who want more information on the presentation that I'm doing today, here are the two links to the journal GM Crops where you can download the papers. They are available on open access, so there's no charges to um, accessing those documents. And for those of you who might want even more detail, uh, there is a longer, more than 200 page version available from our website at the address shown at the bottom of the slide. The latest impact report covers the period from 1996 to 2018. We look at three main aspects on the socio-economic side, the uh, impact on farm income and productivity, and on the environmental side, two aspects um, associated with changes in pesticide usage and greenhouse gas emissions. Methodology, how have we undertaken the work? We essentially review and use the increasingly considerable literature available on the impact of the technology that has developed over the last 25 years. We also uh, undertake some of our own analysis because as you may or may not realize, um, there's not analysis available of every trait in every country for every year. So we have to do some of our own analysis and extrapolation of other people's work to try and make the analysis as accurate and up to date as possible. We make use of current prices, yields, exchange rate information. And we review pesticide usage information um, and make comparisons between typical treatments on conventional versus um, GM crop alternatives. And lastly, we review the literature on carbon impacts, mainly related to fuel changes and soil carbon, but I'll explain that further later in the presentation. This uh, slide actually gives you a summary of the key findings of the report, which I will 
discuss in more detail, but I thought it was worthwhile putting this slide up at the start. Essentially, over this period of analysis, we estimate that the technology has resulted in a reduction in pesticide usage of 776 million kilograms less active ingredient used. That's an 8.6% reduction. But in terms of um, the impact on the environment as measured by the EIQ indicator, again, I'll come on to that in more detail, it is a larger 19% reduction. For the farmers who've used the technology, they've seen their incomes increase by an aggregate amount of 225 billion US dollars in extra farm income. The technology is delivered mainly through higher yields, 824 million tonnes of more food, fibre and feed, and carbon emissions, example of 2018, the technology has contributed to reducing global emissions by 23 billion kilograms less carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. In terms of um, the farm income gains, in 2018, the reduction has been equal, the increase in farm income has been equal to 19 billion US dollars worth of extra farm income. In relation to the four main crops where this technology is used, corn, canola, cotton and soybeans, this is roughly equal to adding 5.8% to the value of the global production of those four crops. As I indicated, the cumulative gain is 225 billion. And if you average that gain over the area that has been planted to crops using the technology, it works out as an average gain of $97 per hectare. And interestingly, if you split that income, that increase in income share between developed and developing countries, it's roughly 50-50, although the balance is in favour of 52% of developing countries. This slide gives you um, the spread of the average farm income gain by country. Um, and the key take home message from this is that the highest levels of farm income gain have tended to be in developing countries. But again, I'll speak more about this in following slides. This slide gives you uh, a spread of the farm income gains by country. And you can see here that United States farmers have gained the most from using the technology. This is not surprising really, given that American farmers were the first to adopt this technology in a significant way in the late 1990s. And by about 2005, 2004, more than 90% of all four of those crops have been using the technology in the United States. You'll also see the significant um, contributions that gains have given to other countries in South America, like Argentina and Brazil, and through the use of insect resistant cotton in India and China. I think it's also worth recognizing um, that there are other reasons why farmers quite like this technology other than just the straight dollar gain that they may have got from using the technology. And this slide gives you a summary of some of those impacts. I won't go through them all, um, but if you look at the herbicide tolerant crops, many farmers um, talk about the benefits they get from greater flexibility and convenience in how they use, how they can farm and how it's facilitated them moving away from a plow based to a no tillage production system. On the insect resistant crop side, 
uh, many farmers refer to the benefits of helping them reduce their production risk. Essentially, they um, worry less about the extent to which a pest may be destroying their crops. Um, and in the case of a crop like cotton, where traditionally it's been subject to a lot of applications of insecticides, often by farmers using little or no protective equipment, um, the technologies helped significantly reduce the number of insecticide applications, which has resulted in improved health for farmers and farm workers. This slide more than any other in my presentation probably gives a flavor of why a lot of farmers adopt this technology and then stay in it. This summarizes the returns on the investment. So if you take the gross benefit of the technology, inclusive of the cost of the technology, because farmers typically have to pay higher prices for the seed to use the technology, you can see that the average cost of the technology when related to the total benefit has been 27% of the total benefit. And in developing countries, the total cost has been 23%. So in terms of returns on investment, you can see that for every extra dollar that a farmer spends in buying the biotech seed, they're getting on average a $3.75 return on their investment. And in developing countries, the average return is even higher at $4.42 per hectare, per dollar. Um, these are extremely high and very significant returns on investment. And more than any other reason, as I've said, give a clear indication of why the technology has been popular with many farmers who have adopted it. In terms of where are these benefits coming from, 72% of them are coming from yield gains, with the remaining gains coming from reductions in the cost of production. Very broadly, the yield gains are coming mostly from the insect resistant technology and the cost savings mostly from the herbicide tolerant technology. And lastly, the yield gains are greatest in developing countries and the cost savings tend to be greatest in developed countries. I've, heard, I've now got a two or three slides looking at the impact of the insect resistant technology by crop. Um, this slide gives you um, an indication of the average yield gains that have been achieved by farmers using this technology. So in corn, across all the countries that have used the technology, the average yield gain has been 16.5%. And you can see the variations by different countries, um, and that largely reflects the extent of pest pressures and the damage that... Um, pests are causing to farm farmers and how effective or ineffective the alternative conventional control mechanisms were. Note that the highest yield benefits are tended to be in developing countries again, like the Philippines, Colombia, Honduras. In relation to cotton, the same analysis, average yield gain 13.7%, highest yield gains um, in developing countries, um, including India, although I have a specific uh, slide on cotton in India in a minute. Um, insect resistant soybeans um, released in 2013 in South America, where the average yield gain has been nine and a half percent. You have had some yield gains uh, arising from the adoption of herbicide tolerant traits. And this slide gives you a summary of some of that analysis. 
Um, but this is there to just highlight that some farmers have got yield improvements from using herbicide tolerant technology from improved uh, weed control mainly and in South America how the technology has helped farmers um, adopt no-till production practices which has shortened the total production time from point of preparing soil for seed application and harvesting so that they've been able to grow a second crop of soybean in the same season after weeds. If you then um, aggregated up all the yield gains from the adoption of the technology and um, equated them to extra production of the four main crops, this slide shows that the technology over the period from 1996 to 2018 has been responsible for the world producing approximately an extra 278 million tonnes of soya beans and just under 500 million tonnes more corn um, and just under 33 million tonnes of cotton lint 14 million tonnes more canola. If you were to um, then turn that extra production round and say, what would be the extra area of conventional agricultural production that would have been required to have produced that extra production? The next slide gives you an indication of the extra conventional crop area that would have been required if biotech crop technology had not been used in 2018, purely for the 2018 extra production figures. And you can see from that, that the world would have had to have planted 24.2 million hectares of additional conventional cropping to those four crops. To give you some context, that's roughly equal to about 38% of the cropping area in Brazil. So it's quite a significant area. Focusing um, some of the more analysis on India and the use of insect resistant cotton, um, introduced in 2002, um, in 2018, 95% of the crop was using the technology. The average yield impact has been 29% yield improvement. Average farm income gain, $993.56 of extra farm income. Interestingly, if you look at the return on investment for every extra dollar an Indian cotton farmer has spent on the technology, they've got nearly $13 worth of extra farm income. That is at the highest level of the range of performance and return on investment of any of the GM crop technology around the world. None of the technology in any other countries have got to that, to any higher level. That's right at the, the top level. Um, so it's a very impressive performance and probably gives you a clear indication of why 95% of Indian cotton farmers use this technology and can consistently have stayed with using it. In terms of aggregated benefit, it comes out that $24 billion worth of extra farm income since 2002, and it's resulted in an increased production of 14.73 million tonnes of extra cotton lint. Just to give you um, an, a comparison um, of the use of stacked corn, herbicide tolerant and insect resistant cotton, insect resistant corn in Vietnam. Um, this comes from uh, a paper that I co-authored that came out only two or three weeks ago related to Vietnam. And you can see here the 
um, significant yield impact returns that Vietnamese farmers have got from using the technology. And interestingly, their average returns on investment, um, depending on the yield comparisons you use, are getting up to close to the levels of return on investment that the Indian cotton farmers have got. Moving on to impact on pesticide use. Since 1996, the use of, in, of use of pesticides on the biotech crop area has fallen by 70, 776 million kilograms of active ingredient. That's 8.6% reduction. Give you context, that's equivalent to 1.6 times the annual amount of pesticide active ingredient put on crops in China. Um, in terms of the associated environmental impact, as measured by the EIQ indicators developed at Cornell University, it's a larger 19% reduction. The largest environmental gains have come from the use of insect resistant cotton, where there's been a 32% reduction in the amount of insecticide active ingredient used, um, and a 35% reduction in the associated environmental impact as measured by the EIQ measure. Interestingly, to give you the context of India, over the period from 2002, we estimate that that's resulted in a reduction of 137 million kilograms less insecticide applied to the Indian cotton crop. Roughly a third reduction um, and a more significant 43% reduction in the associated environmental impact as measured by the EIQ indicator. Moving on to greenhouse gas emissions, the technology essentially contributes to lowering greenhouse gas emissions from two main sources. Firstly, reduced fuel use, uh, where mechanical application of pesticides is used. Um, you apply less pesticide, you reduce the fuel use through less spraying and also there is less soil cultivation associated um, with farmers moving to no tillage. Um, and that brings me on to the second area where herbicide tolerant technology has facilitated many farmers moving away from a plough based to a no tillage production system. When you plough the soil, you typically release carbon from decaying plant matter. And in fact, um, ploughing is the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions from arable crop production systems. So if you move to a no tillage system, you get much less uh, release of carbon from the soil, um, and leads, leading to additional carbon storage in the soil. In 2018, we estimated that the reduced fuel use was equivalent to a saving of 2.4 billion kilograms less CO2 re released into the atmosphere. Um, and the no-till facilitation is a larger 20.6 billion kilogram reduction. Overall, that's equivalent to removing 15.3 million cars off the road for a year or equivalent to taking 48% of the cars registered in the United Kingdom off the road for a year. A question I often get asked when related to um, the impact of the technology, well, you have presented all this information about positive impacts. What about negatives? Well, the one that often gets raised um, and is of relevance has been over-reliance on the use of glyphosate by some farmers in North and South America 
with the use of herbicide tolerant crops that has contributed to the development of weeds becoming resistant to the herbicides um, and has resulted in farmers having to adapt and change their weed control systems. Um, farmers have essentially had to increase the use of herbicide, other herbicides to help control weeds that are no longer controlled by glyphosate and that has increased their cost of production relative to 15 years ago. However, it is important to put that in context that weed resistance is a problem that occurred before GM crops were available to farmers and they are equally applicable to all crops grown. Um, and the trend towards increased herbicide use to address weed resistant problems has been equally apparent in conventional crops as it has in herbicide tolerant GM crops. And throughout the period of our analysis of making the comparisons, the environmental profile of the herbicides used on herbicide tolerant crops has continued to have a better profile than its equivalent on conventional crops. And lastly, the herbicide tolerant crops have continued to remain more profitable than their conventional alternatives for the vast majority of farmers using the technology. Bringing my um, presentation towards its close now, I just put up the, the slide of the summary again. I uh, won't go through the numbers again, but they're just there for um, you to see again for a moment. Um, and moving on to concluding prom, um, comments. Um, if you had to summarize the impact of the insect resistant technology, it's contributed to giving farmers higher yields, it's reduced their production risk, reduced their insecticide use, um, and contributed to a more reliable food supply system and the adoption of more environmentally friendly farming methods. The herbicide tolerant technology has given higher incomes, has uh, facilitated extra production and the adoption of more sustainable farming systems, most notably the adoption of no tillage production systems in North and South America, which has contributed to reducing carbon emissions. Both of the technologies have made important contributions to increasing global production of the four main crops of soybeans, corn, canola and cotton. And that has resulted in reducing the pressure to bring new land into agriculture. And more recently, we're starting to see new traits such as drought tolerant corn, fungal resistant potatoes, insect resistant, insect resistant brinjal, now being adopted and beginning to contribute positively to both um, farm income returns and environmentally in the regions where farmers are using these technologies. Lastly, on my last slide, I would say after 23 years of widespread use, I'd say there is now considerable amounts of consistent evidence in peer review literature on the impact of this technology. And the work that I've summarized in my presentation today adds to that literature. Again, for those of you who want to access um, the material I presented in more detail, the links here are shown to the two peer review papers and the third one at the bottom, for those of you who may be interested, is the link to the Vietnam paper that we released um, two or three weeks ago, um, all available at the GM Crops and Food Journal website. And I would encourage 
any of you to read these papers and the references cited within and draw your own conclusions about the impact of the technology. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward later to hopefully answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. I think that was a very well articulated presentation on the benefits that we have seen since the introduction of the technology in 1996. And we can very clearly see the benefits in terms of the pesticide reduction, uh, yield improvements, cost benefit ratios, environmental impact in terms of reduction of carbon dioxide emissions and various other parameters. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we do look forward to having more interaction with you. I would now request uh, EJ to put out the question uh, for a poll. Uh, can you do that, EJ, please? So all of you, please look at these questions and answer the question, please. Questions are to be raised at the end of all that. Uh, that is all our, those are questions in the end. This is just a question from the organizers to the participants to answer. So the question is, what is the most important impact of crop biotechnology that resonates with you? Increase in farm income, decrease pesticide spray, contributes to food security, reduces environmental footprint, all of the above, none of the above. You can click and then uh, submit. Can we have the results, CJ, please? The 10 percent are saying that increase in farmers' income resonates with them. 7 percent decrease in pesticide spray. 7 percent on food security. 3 percent reduces environmental impact. All of the above, 72 percent. That's great. Thank you very much. We now move uh, back. We now move forward to go back to Dr. Uh, um, yeah. So, can you are you ready now? Uh, EJ is going to share my slide. Okay, ah, okay. I'm That's back. Okay. okay, so uh, actually, this is supposed to be an introduction to Graham Brooks' presentation, but I'd like just to show you what happened during the 2018, how much we have gained in terms of hectareage in the country. So, let's see the next slide, please. So in 2018, we have this, uh, next slide please, EJ. Okay, we have this data that we have accumulated from 1996 to 2018, 191.7 million hectares planted to buy the crops. And you can see there that the developing countries is now way ahead of the industrialized countries. We're now putting together the 2019 data and it looks like it's going to be similar. And next slide, please. The trait shows us that the herbicide tolerance, which used to be very high, is now going down because farmers are looking at the stock traits right now. So here it is currently 80.5 million hectares for the stock traits, 87.5 million hectares for the herbicide tolerance and 23.7 million hectares for the insect tolerant ones. So our farmers are now getting the feel of how it is to plant stack traits because they do not have to invest much in terms of insecticide and uh, in terms of seeds. And they're not using insecticides anymore and they are now looking at the no-till technology. Let's move to the next slide. So the next slide shows us that in terms of crops, it is the herbicide tolerant soybean. Soybean has been increasing and currently it's still the highest. And it shows us that 50% of all by the crops planted in 2018 are the, were the, the herbicide tolerant soybean. This is followed by maize, cotton, and canola. 
Next slide, please. Looking at the adoption rates, it shows us that in 2018, 78% of the global soybean is already biotech or GM, 76% is cotton, GM cotton, 30% is GM leaves, and 29% is GM canola. So we still have a lot of area to be planted to GM maize. And GM maize also has uh, a lot more potential because it can be used for food as well as biofuels and also for livestock feeds. Next slide, please. Now, these are the 26 countries who plant, which planted in 2018. So there were 26, 10 in Latin American countries, nine in the Asia Pacific where we are, two North American countries, two in the EU and three African countries. So you can see that India here is number five because of its BT cotton. And I, I know that we have a lot of speakers today who can attest to the benefits of BT cotton in India. Next slide, please. So these are now the top five countries which planted in 2018. You can see that USA is the highest. Still, it was 75 million hectares, followed by Brazil, Argentina, Canada, and India. India planted 11.6 million hectares at 95% adoption rate. Next slide, please. So from all of this, we can see that ISA is putting together, has already this GMO approval database. And we have from 1992 to 99, since 1992 to 2018, we had 70 countries which have approved biota crops for food use, feed use, and cultivation. So this includes those countries which do not plant, but are importing it for direct use for food and feed. And so we had 4,349 regulatory approvals. USA has the most number of approved events. Maize has the most number of approved events. And the herbicide tolerant maize has the most number of events in both developing and industrialized countries. You can look at our ISA website and we have there the GM approval database that we update regularly. Next slide, please. So this shows to us, this was an old data and we can see that Graham Brooks has already provided us a lot of information that by the crops contribute to food security, sustainability and climate change. And so we, I thank you very much for your attention and I hope that we can discuss so much more of this, including the studies of Graham Brooks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, that was very brief and but very concise and very informative. Uh, we move on to Dr. Mai now. Uh, Dr. Mai doesn't need much introduction to all of you in India. Dr. C.D. Mai is a renowned agricultural scientist and is the president of the South Asia Biotechnology Center, the CABC, New Delhi. He was formerly vice chancellor, MAU Parbhani, director of Central Institute of Cotton Research, CACR Nagpur, and agriculture commissioner, government of India, uh, before retiring as the chairman of ASRB, which is the Agricultural Sciences Scientist Recruitment Board. Um, Dr. Mai promoted the production technologies of cotton, groundnut, sunflower, and coarse cereals. He was associated with the first commercial release of insect-resistant cotton in India and instrumental in developing biotech infrastructure in ICR institutions. Dr. Mai has been Alexander Humboldt Fellow of Germany. He is a recipient of several awards for agricultural development. Dr. C.D. Mai obtained his agricultural degrees from Maharashtra and PhD from IARI in plant pathology. Dr. Mai, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ram. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, in the next 15 minutes on the impact of BT cotton in the production and utility in India. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, the next slide shows uh, uh, next slide uh, very clearly shows, I think everybody knows, that we are growing all the four species of cotton. One interesting part of the slide is that we have nearly 7.5 million smallholder farmers who have less than 1.5 hectares of land. And that is a very crucial problem 
even sometimes i think the estimates are that it could be about 8 million small holder farms so by and large our holding is very small i think this slide shows that particular importance and we have a very robust cotton value chain where we employ nearly more than 50 million people in cotton value chain the next slide please uh, the next slide will show you the uh, as as everybody i think gram has also showed and then aldemita had very clearly said but we have still small areas of arboreum in this map of india herbaceum barbadans but all these they occupy less than total 3% now rest of all is only a hybrid cotton area and that to bt hybrid so this is uh, the uh, map of india and still after 18 years you can see that the farmers are still growing more somebody says about 95% uh, 11.5 million hectares i think next slide i will show you then uh, next slide please you can see the area has now increased to i think about uh, this was 18 there is a steep increase in area but there is much more increase in the production and productivity of cotton now if you see there is very interesting trend i always call it uh, that there is some suppression in the last few years in the average productivity i think that year 15 16 but now we have managed thing very well and i think now the yields are uh, almost quite stable next slide i will show you the latest figures which uh, the next slide please next slide please this is the latest cotton sowing report of the current season now i think uh, this season very clearly shows that we have now more area of cotton in the country that means we will be crossing 129 uh, almost a uh, uh, 12.9 million hectares of area and if you see the compound growth rate highest growth rate was when we had bt cotton now there has been slowly a reduction in the productivity areas and that too i think we are uh, now coming to a new phase what we call it as a stagnation in the cotton yield next next slide please if i always call indian cotton a very unique situation we whenever we brought some improved technology there was a jump but there are phases uh, yield acceleration and this yield acceleration phases if you see since independence of cotton now you can see 202 the inter multiple gene bt cotton yields they have tremendously gone up so this is where i always call it because there used to be always stagnation now a time has come that should india now here should india go in for what we call it as htbt cotton i will show you in the end next slide next slide please yeah. why do we uh, we adopted uh, bt cotton i think we, our adoption has been the highest in the world why because of frequent outbreaks of helicobacter pylori i think i have seen as a cotton farmer i have seen as a cotton uh, researcher and as a director cotton that every alternate year our cotton yield used to drop because of the bolvar problem and that's how i think the cotton uh, became bt cotton became very popular in the became very popular Country, which many people do not understand of the best and then there are new hybrid feature next slide the next transformation of cotton next slide please yeah you can see the adoption rate now this uh, uh, is, uh, the adoption rate is uh, i have repeated it almost 2002 onwards what is, and you can see the area and productivity next slide please yeah this is what i call it as the important part is that india was a net importer of cotton till bt cotton arrival that is up to 
nearly 2 million bales of 170 kg each used to be imported to run our factory today the situation is reversed we have one stage of almost uh, uh, exporting 9 million bales 90 million bales out of the 9 million bales and now you can see that there has been a tremendous uh, export growth and simultaneously we have also sufficient stocks to run our own industry useful so that has occurred in the cotton value chain export and import of cotton next simultaneously i think uh, uh, this uh, i have just uh, give you figure 15 16 almost 6.9 lakh bales and 19 abhi uh, uh, 1920 if about uh, 5 million bales last year even this year in corona's time we are expecting that it will cross 5 million bales as export very interesting and that's why the cotton is our actually is if you compare internationally is the cheapest cotton the export market is will always be very beneficial to them next slide this uh, one particular slide i am deliberately showing because this impact which has carried on the staple length of indian cotton is very interesting if you see seven we used to produce medium staple cotton 67% 63% long staple cotton and only 22% medium we are now actually producing very small amount of short staple cotton now there has been a demand of short staple cotton and now our breeders are now working on bt cotton in short staple next slide please yeah i think i need not for uh, the insecticide use because uh, elaborately said that how there has been a continuous reduction in the insecticide use now we are almost stabilized and for bollworms there has been you can see the kg of insecticide use how oh, this has actually reduced slide i would like to also show one very slide that is on the environment impact because bt cotton in general delivered significant environmental benefit by reducing the insecticide use at nearly 50% i am grossly telling you but then what happened is that these sap sucking pest of cotton and overall usage of insecticide may have slightly increased but then we have all those what we call it as the uh, predators and parasites they have actually they are quite uh, 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 sorry yeah their uh, population has increased so there is a benefit effect of the environment next slide is all socio economic benefits i think uh, they are already covered i need not uh, next slide please it not uh, next slide here yeah, is very important because it is a multi purpose crop next slide Now, cotton is not only grown for the length. You have length fiber, thirty-three percent. Cotton seeds, very important. Then we have inters, hulls. We have also what we call it as uh, the cotton seed oil. There has been a tremendous increase output. The moment we have adopted BT cotton, there has been a major output in all these areas. So this is very important. next slide the value addition of cotton is uh, if you claim uh, nearly 1 uh, 12.5 million tons of cotton seed oil per uh, year has been increased so this even the stocks now there are lot of factories which are coming on the cotton stocks there are also oil particularly i am more keen 
that the vegetable oil in the country is a problem and that is how we have uh, actually supplementary uh, uh, vegetable slide next slide please these are some of the value added product cotton stock next slide next slide please move to next slide yeah now this is cotton oil seed production you can see we are nearly we, our requirement is 25 million tons of cotton oil consumption and we are producing the vegetable oils only nearly 2 million tons 15 million tons is imported but out of this 10 million 0.5 million tons is provided by cotton alone so this is otherwise earlier we used to have high something very few amount of uh, the cake or the meal for the fodder is an important part next slide next through two slides you can skip next to next next again yeah future now we are looking for genomics we wanted hdps cultivar suitable for mechanical picking salt drought resistant hybrids gene mining and cotton also can hatch is through these things next slide so we are now looking that if there we want a breakthrough in cotton i think we need some more biotechnologies to really upgrade next slide next hdbt trials are completed but we are not permitted yet there are fir's laws these are illegal plantation of hdbt 12 against jol maharashtra farmer for illegal sowing of bt cotton next this is a news item and still farmers are not worried despite ban ht cotton is widely cultivated in maharashtra nearly 15% area of central india is now covered by illegal although government has not permitted that means they want a technology where they can really save money on the labor particularly hard earned labor which are spending a lot of money on the weeding next next to next this is now only just i wanted to show that how it is hello ha huh? yeah illegal cotton sales sales surge in maharashtra and other state next these are all new items which i thought very interesting times of india has given hdbt cotton grown illegally in three states telangana gujarat and maharashtra next now cotton picking has been one of our major uh, labor requirement and uh, with the advent of cotton high density we are trying there are some very classical work being done by the indian seed industry to have bt cotton in the high density plantation material next and our experience shows with the high density planting that if we have good hybrids under high density i think Uh, this will give you more yield next slide we have some results of hdbt you can see nearly uh, the yield can increase from 12.5 to 16.87 quintal with reduced cost so this technology is now being targeted by many seed companies and in india i think we will definitely have this thing because india cotton is the life for a large number of farmers it's a cash crop for them and therefore they are ready to adopt any new technology so i think i come to the end next slide two slides are only to say you thank you very much king cotton has come back in the country and uh, it is because of bt cotton that's what is i said that these are articles which have come the after bt cotton has come king cotton also comes back thank you very much next slide last slide now cotton is cool india is the only country where we have nearly 60% utilization of cotton in other countries it is only 40% and these are some of our heroes who are always using cotton dresses thank you very much thank you thank sir. you dr thank, thank you dr mai that was very interestingly presented uh, information about our experience with bt cotton Uh, i think there was never any doubt about some of the benefits that you have uh, presented today 
but it's very good to see that uh, we have not only improved yields uh, reduced cost made our farmer more competitive but also we have uh, reduced pesticides use uh, by close to 50% although the use on some of the sucking pests uh, would have gone up because of the natural phenomenon of uh, sucking pests going up when the chewing pest is reduced uh, but overall still there is more close to 50% reduction in pesticides cotton seed oil 1 and 1/2 million tons which is a, which is actually a part of our uh, edible oil uh, portfolio now and the need for herbicide tolerance because of the increased labor costs and the need for mechanical picking and hdps which is showing almost 21% higher yields mechanical picking is becoming more and more necessary because the labor cost for picking is now almost 15 to 20% of the price so i think these are all very compelling factors which uh, point out to the need for more technologies upgradation of technologies and also the yield stagnation which is happening because of lack of new technology in cotton so thank you very much for bringing out all these uh, points uh, now we move to dr bansal dr bansal also is a very well known person in our biotech circles here dr kc bansal is an adjunct faculty of the national institute of plant biotechnology iri new delhi he was formerly director of the national bureau of plant genetic resources nbpgr as it is called and the coordinator of the national project on transgenics in crops he has contributed significantly in the area of plant biotechnology has published over 150 research papers and book chapters professor bansal's research findings and outcomes are cited and used in crop improvement programs by several laboratories and institutions within and outside the country he was the first to get selected for the prestigious norman borlaug chair for crop improvement by icr Professor Bansal was awarded the second highest award of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences by the Honorable Minister of Agriculture of India. Professor Bansal is a fellow of the two prominent science academies, National Academy of Agricultural Sciences and National Academy of Sciences India. He was educated at IIRI and conducted advanced research at Harvard University in USA. Uh, Dr. K. C. Bansal, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ram, for the for the nice introduction, and I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share the progress of the work which we are doing in India under the title Biotech Crops for Indian Agriculture. So when we talk of biotechnology and its role in agriculture, I thought it's better to first highlight what are the challenges which are faced in total by the global agriculture, but particularly by Indian agriculture. We all know about the climate change, and as a result, we have shrinking availability of these natural resources, land and water particularly, and there are emerging biotic and abiotic stress factors. And there's a big issue of or concern of malnutrition and also, of course, we're looking forward to sustainability production, you know, in, in, in regard to agriculture. And so we're looking for some solutions. So I was asking a question, what are the solutions and the way forward? As a scientist, it appears that the application of these emerging tools of biotechnology to genetically improve, to genetically improve the crops is rather important. And it's more important in a country like India, you know, among all other countries in the world, we are one of the most populated countries in the world and we still have 15 to 17% of the economy coming from agriculture. You know, in India, to promote agricultural biotechnology, a department of Government of India was started in 1986, DBT, Department of Biotechnology, wherein we have been able to provide some of those tools to improve the crops using biotechnological tools. For example, we started with gene discovery, to genomics, to molecular markers, to, you know, marker-assisted breeding, genetic engineering and GM crops, and now we are, of course, you know, talking of genome editing, you know, which is for an improvement we all know over the technology we have on GM crops. And we have created an excellent infrastructure. There are several R&D projects in progress. There are several translational research platforms, particularly for GM crops. And there is a very good public-private partnership. And most importantly, we have a robust biotechnology, you know, regulatory system. So what are those relevant traits for Indian agriculture? Here, there are several of them when we talk of agronomic traits or we talk of nutritional quality traits. The whole idea is to reduce the environmental impact of agriculture 
and move towards more of sustainability, you know, way of production rather than utilizing those resources, you know, you know, mindlessly as we're doing currently, whether we talk of, you know, um, and more importantly is enhanced use efficiency of water, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or even radiation, or even land to increase the productivity and to save it. As, as you know, Dr. Graham very well, you know, presented, there's a lot of land which has been saved as a result of the cultivation of some of the GM crops globally. And with regard to nutritional quality traits, our idea is to address the malnutrition and moreover looking into the current pandemic, it is important to also look into the nutritional aspects of human beings to enhance immunity levels, which is very important. And this slide is, of course, has a lot of information, but that I thought is important enough from the contents point of view, particularly when we talk about agriculture, you know, and those crops and traits which we would like to develop through GM route alone, you know, not that conventional land building is always important, that will ever remain important, but there are certain traits and crops which you can only be developed through the GM technology. And these are some of the crops I'm mentioning here, particularly with regard to oil seeds. You know, India imports edible oil worth of 16,000 crores of rupees, which turns into billions of dollars. So therefore important that we focus first on mustard, groundnut, and soybeans, some of these traits. Pulses again, we are not sufficient in pulses again. We import pulses worth of 14,000 crores annually. These figures are annually. And then both the crops, chickpea and pigeon pea, and we are largest producer, largest consumers of the pulses in India, in the world. And, and these resistance to port border in both the crops is very, very important. There's a 40 to 80% at times reduction as a result of, you know, this infestation, if it is high level, you know, by these port borders. Cereals, of course, rice occupies a you know, prominent position here, and it utilizes rice alone, you know, insecticide worth rupees two and a half thousand crores, which is again running into billions of dollars. So apart from even saving these insecticides and protecting the plants and producing more, there's also an important issue with regard to global climatic change, as Dr. Dr. Graham Brooks mentioned, you know, that we need to increase water use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency, and also to develop soft crops, particularly I'm talking about rice. Similarly, other cereals and direct seeded rice is becoming prominent to save water, you know, which takes a lot of water when we talk of flooded rice and kind of here we're talking, but this direct seeded rice important issue is again, you know, we need for sure a herbicide tolerant trait. And similarly in other cereals and again vegetables, they're in general in vegetables to save them from insect pressure, we need about 12,000 crores of insecticides, which is again a huge amount. When you add it up all, you can imagine you know, how much money we are losing as a result of only saving these crops from some of these biotech and abiotic pressures. And then in food crops, we have got banana and papaya and commercial crops, cotton, sugarcane, jute, and, and rubber for various different traits. So, so far, GM crops research in India, of course, you know, there is a good amount of, I would say, R&D effort, which is in progress, both by public and private sector. This is an advantage we have in India, that both public and private sector playing a key role in addressing some of the issues. And already, as you can see from here, 23 biotech crops we're working with. In the slide, which I mentioned to you, if you add up to all these crops, about 23, and in all these crops, there's an effort which is in progress. And there are a total about 67 biotech, biotech trades or GM trades, which are being worked upon, you know, and there are different stages of development. And out of those 67, 39 trades are by the public sector and 20 trades by, by the private sector and eight are from the other autonomous institutions. And as you all know, BT Cotton was our first product. We have heard enough, an excellent presentation by Dr. Mai already. So I'm not talking about that at all, but immediately after BT Cotton, the crop which was approved in 2002 by the apex body was this fruit and shoot border resistant transgenic BT brinjal as we call it. Go from a private sector, the event EE1. But then we do have from two private, from two ICR institutes, public sector, wherein different you know, events have also been developed, you know? And, but then the same event, EE1, as you all know again, was commercialized in Bangladesh and they have already released four different varieties out of it. And they're taking a significant amount of advantage in terms of reduction in pesticide use by 28% and increased profit to the farmers by 49% alone from, you know, not that it is so widely spread, but at the same time, this is the kind of good advantage Bangladesh is already harvesting, and we are at a loss in India at the moment. But that was 2010. Now, up to 2016, seven, you know, about 
a dozen more crops, you know, they, they are undergoing these biosafety research trials, you know, by both again public and private sector for various important traits. And here, the, I'm like going to highlight more about mustard, you know, which is a GM mustard developed based on this Barnes bar store bar style story of, of uh, hybrid seed production. And this is what the GM mustard has already been again approved in 2016 by the apex body, though not yet commercially released. Not approved, I would say it's been recommended for approval by the apex body. And here in this GM mustard, the advantage of the seed yield you can get even up to 37%. You know, if there are even conservative estimates. I'm very happy if we can get even 25% of advantage from the current levels of production. And these figures have been, in fact, drawn by even making all those you know, comparisons with the national checks, which we have a system here, a best system in the world of all India coordinated research improvement programs of various crops. So it has undergone all those tests, even from agronomic point of view, and Professor Deepak Pantel has developed this from Delhi University. And this is what is the second in line after BT Cotton that we, we, are, we are expecting, you know, for it to, to be released. Now, when we talk of these further approvals and down up to the level of 2020 after 2016, there are again, you know, these about dozen of crops, you can say, both by public and private sectors, you know, for various traits. And again, the traits which are from predominant are, of course, insect resistance or herbicide tolerance or combined insect and herbicide tolerance, particularly cotton, as, as Dr. Mai mentioned, you know, BT, HD, BT cotton is very, very important. But then they are again, you know, at different levels of, of trial. And these are some of the meetings, the last meeting of the apex body took place in 20, on 29th of July this year. So this is, you know, we are making a good amount of progress with regard to the conduct of these trials or approval from the ex body. And finally, in fact, from the public sector alone, I want to highlight this point particularly. I come from Indian Council of Agriculture Research. I was serving there for about 35, 40 years. And then we developed one of the largest ever a project, you know, on transgenics in crops under ICAR, the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, worth again rupees hundreds of crores in again about 20 crops in different traits again insect pest resistance or drought and salinity tolerance virus resistance or fungal resistance depending upon that these are the traits and these are the crops where conventional breeding will take a lot of time it may not be even possible to reach there as we have seen in case of BT cotton but here again there is an excellent amount of uh, output I can say from in the last about 15 years started this work in 2005 with, with large number of institutions as, as shown, you know, not in this slide here, but several institutions, you know, shown here, for example, in different crops, there are about 10 crops, you know, for various traits, not only, you know, resistance to insect pests, both PGP and GP, but also abiotic excess tolerance, you know, which is very important or in case of brinjal, uh, you know, uh, again, insect pest resistance, but drought tolerance in case of tomato and, and in rice and many other crops. So overall, today, you know, when we talk of 2020, we have about 83, you know, yields in different crops with different traits, 16 crops. And these are the ones, you know, dominantly by, you know, rice, 23, cotton, 20, you know, maize, you know, mustard, brinjal, etc. As you can see, it goes down even to the level of rubber and sugar cane, which are some of our commercial crops I mentioned before. But then again, with regard to biosafety, though India itself is doing all those kinds of analysis in all those biotech crops I mentioned before, but again, globally, if you talk about it, more than 20 years of data, in fact, 25 years, I would say, that the GM food safety and environmental safety data proves that all is safe with regard to biosafety, to human health, to animal health, to environment. And I'm very happy to see, you know, some of the data presented by Graham Brooks and also this particular report says so, that is from U.S. National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, you know, and, and there are 123 Nobel laureates attest to this, this, uh, this hypothesis, I mean, th this kind of analysis that, yes, the, these crops are safe. And this particular, you know, report also has exactly said, and many of these things which Graham Brooks mentioned in his report, I don't want to report, repeat that, but coming down to the system in India we have, that's a very robust Indian system, I must say. I don't want to go into the details of it because of the time. But then, as our Honorable Prime Minister of India has announced, India to be self-reliant. We call it as Atam Nirbhar Bharat. So to be you know, self-reliant, we feel that GM crops could be a very integral component to, to produce more in agriculture. So therefore, what 
as a scientist, I feel I have been developing several of these GM crafts myself. You know that a clear policy is needed for, for sure. Existing regulatory approval process needs to be accelerated. Approval from states should be there without delay. Political support is needed in favor of relevant GM crops. We just don't want approval for any GM crop, crop which is important, which we cannot produce otherwise using conventional breeding methods. So therefore these relevant GM crops, and by the way, just to extend, though this is not the talk for talk today, but then these SDN1 and SDN2 products without foreign DNA to be also treated as non-GM. Because I was a part of discussion by the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, where I fortunately happen to be a member. This report has come out only recently, where we have recommended that these two products, these two type of products, you know, should be treated as non-GMO, as many other countries, including US, USA in the world, have done. But why do we need all that? Simply because of sustainability and profitability to small for smallholder farmers. It's very, very important. And I believe again, you know. I have been personally involved through this National Academy. National Academy of Agricultural Sciences has been playing a very big role in promoting GM crops in the country. You know, we have we have personally made interventions in Supreme Court case. You know, there are several policy papers in favor of GM crops, and we have even written a letter. Fifty eminent scientists have signed this letter. You know, and to the Honorable Prime Minister sometimes in 2015. But we thought that yes, it is having some kind of an impact, and, and also. So there is a kind of an environment which is to be created to me appears now by Niti Ayo. This is our kind of a planning commissioner from India, you know, where they're trying to bring some of the even opponents to the technology or even supporters, you know, some of us, they have been invited, but the meeting to my knowledge has not happened yet. And we were waiting for the move. But nevertheless, I think there's a positive environment for sure. Government will continue to back GM crops. That's what DBT secretary says. And that was in July 2019, just about a year ago. And, and then in 2020, you know, the future of GM crops in India is positive. It's a positive environment. And they're looking forward to some of these gains you know, in terms of improving farm efficiency or sustainability and food security. I believe GM crops, as has been amply clear and demonstrated, you know, by the report from Graham Brooks, that it, it is possible improving farm efficiency. You know, when you talk of sustainability or you talk of food security. So actually speaking, you know, um, I've always been in favor of GM crops, particularly to drive benefit to the farmers. In India, we have this IPL cricket season going on. So I selected my own B11, actually, of some of these crops with two or three extras. So this is BT Brazil, if it is approved immediately for commercial release, followed by GM mustard. And BT Brinjal EE1 event, which have been already commercialized in Bangladesh. GM mustard, which is a hybrid mustard technology. HT BT cotton. Virus resistant cotton, nitrogen use efficient cotton, and DST drought sulfur and cotton. Dr. Mai Empley talked about it that we need more of technologies apart from BT in, in cotton. Then, of course, HT, BT, maize, BT, chickpea, and PGP both are very important. Rice, where we're spending too much of money on insecticide. And then again, you know, rice should be also combined with drought tolerance and even high, you know, this is herbicide tolerant rice, salt tolerant wheat. <laughs> late blight resistant potato is also very important. Late blight resistant potato. And we have out of that network, which I was talking to you about, you know, one of the products. At the end, I would just like to remind you all that this technology, about 30 years ago, when we started, you know, an experiment by these three scientists in 1983, 30 years ago, 30 years later exactly, you know, Mark Owen Mentogu, Mary Bell Chilton, and Robert Fraley were awarded the World Food Prize. In, in, 30 years later. And today, when we know that there's a Nobel Prize that has also gone for genome editing to both these, you know, um, you know, intelligent ladies, you know, we are very proud of it. But important is that these technologies, which have been developed either by these, you know, world laureates or by these Nobel laureates, it need to be fully utilized for a country like India, more importantly, rest, you know, than any, anywhere else in the world for product development, for agriculture, food and nutrition, or for human and animal health or for environmental you know, safety and sustainability. It's very important. So with this, I give a message, yes, that any science-led approach only can provide a secure, economically and environmentally sound and sustainable global food system. With this, I thank you all, but I also should not forget to thank some of my friends and colleagues who helped me prepare this presentation, particularly Dr. Ratna from FSSI, Dr. Monika Singh, my old colleague from National Bureau of Management Resources and others. 
I thank you for your patience. Thank you, Ram, and thank you, organizers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Bansal, for that excellent presentation. Very informative about what is in store. You know, what is it that we can uh, hope to get, uh, provided the regulatory uh, logjam is cleared and uh, we have a more uh, supportive general environment for the deployment of the technology. But I think it's very clear that you have identified some priorities like oil seeds, um, where it's very important, pulses, oil seeds, DSR uh, rice. You know, many of the people uh, who are in the participants here who eat rice don't know that it takes 5,000 liters of water to produce one yeah. kg of rice. You know, many of them don't know that. So uh, if we want to reduce that water consumption and preserve water, we have to use DSR, direct feed rice, and uh, herbicide tolerant technology will be very useful to control weeds in such a situation. Uh, so I think uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, priority area where fertilizer use efficiency, for example, which can reduce the use of fertilizers, which can reduce the damage to soils, You know, because this is one of the big issues we have in rice and wheat and uh, some of these crops where high use of fertilizers takes place. I think fertilizer use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency will be very, very useful. I think uh, your dream 11 list of uh, crops is also very good. I think this is what uh, we should try to firm up, that what are those priority areas where the technology can be useful in India? Uh, you have also brought out very nicely that um, how many crops have undergone trials and what is the mustard, for example, 25% seed yield improvement, which, has, which was proved in the All India Coordinated uh, Project. Those are the benefits which we can expect, and especially in oil seeds where we are spending 70,000 crores every year on imports. And our, uh, you made a very good point that the Indian regulatory system is very robust. So we should yes. actually back our regulatory system. We should trust our regulatory system and go by what scientific, um, uh, scientific studies they do and make their recommendations eventually. Because I think, uh, uh, because it is the same regulatory system which has cleared your insulin and which has cleared other products which are called RDNA products, which are used by the people. I think there is no reason to disbelieve that uh, their clearance of GM crops is not scientific. So I think uh, field trials should happen. As you said, uh, they should be a part of Atmanabha Bharat. Political support for relevant GM crops. I think this is also a very important point you have made. And uh, government is backing it. Niti Aayog is backing it. There's no doubt about that. Large-scale meta-analysis of uh, safety studies was done by US uh, um, National Academy of Sciences. And also, EU undertook a study on the similar lines and then published a report. Both of them have concluded that the technology is very safe and um, there is no threat or danger to the human and animal health and environment. Right. I think these are all very important points uh, which should actually support the case for large scale, larger deployment, not indiscriminate, but uh, larger deployment in relevant crops and for relevant trades in India for us to take benefit. And uh, thank you very much for bringing out all those points. Thank you. We must so, continue with our efforts. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we have heard uh, so far uh, two scientists, one economist, and uh, we have also heard one uh, information um, providing um, um, uh, academy uh, at the global level, uh, what is uh, happening on the GM crops and what should happen and what is recommended to happen in these crops. So it is a, there is an important link in this, that is a farmer. A farmer has to have his uh, word and uh, has to have the last word usually because that's what matters to all of us finally. It is the farmers who have to speak out for what they need. And that is uh, also something which we must actually support because what the farmer needs is what we must support. I think that is what is uh, very important for all of us to understand. And like Dr. Mai said, the farmers have demonstrated their need for uh, HT technology because of the shortage of labor and increasing labor costs. I think many of us should know that according to government of India's data, between 40 to 60% of the cost of cultivation of farmers in different crops is from labor. So labor cost is the lowest hanging fruit which we must solve so that uh, farmers' profitability can improve. And one of the ways to solve that is through, uh, through use of her, uh, weed management technologies uh, and mechanization. I think these are the things which we must actually support. Uh, so coming to pharma, we have today Mr. Ravichandran, 
who is also a well known farm farmer and farmer leader he is a third generation farmer growing paddy sugarcane cotton pulses etc farming for over 30 years ravichandran has formed united progressive farmers forum to facilitate farmers to aggregate their resources and bridge the gap between the farmers and the consuming industry he is the vice president of the national forum called indian farmers network he is also the global director of global farmer network based in des moines iowa usa as a strong proponent of technology and science he firmly believes that the farm productivity can be increased only through the adoption of scientifically proven technologies including environmentally sustainable farming methods farm mechanization empowerment of women in agriculture bioengineering and through mutual cooperation with fellow farmers he has been playing a major role in developing the mobile based app by the world renowned institutes using artificial intelligence to diagnose plant diseases and pests ravichandran also writes in various magazines in tamil and english emphasizing the need for modern technology in farming so uh, we have uh, mr ravichandran with us and we are very glad that he is joining us yeah. uh from his uh, home village uh, from his village and uh, and uh, it is also great that his uh, wifi and his connectivity is holding up although he is speaking from a remote village thank you very That's much and welcome yeah so mr ravichandran yeah. over to you yeah so yeah uh, good afternoon everyone Uh, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, ISA for providing this uh, wonderful platform to share my thoughts. Uh, I don't have uh, any pie charts or uh, graphs, uh, statistics or bar charts. Uh, but however, I am going to share my experience for uh, 34 years experience in agriculture. And 34, uh, I have been growing cotton for 34 years. I am going to share my experience, 34 years of experience in cotton in this uh, 15 minutes. Yeah, next slide. So I have been farming for over 34 years. I grow rice, cotton, and pulses, and coconut also. Uh, yeah, I'm a proponent of good technology. Next slide. So way back in the year 1986, immediately after finishing, after completing my college education, I entered farming. Uh, so the day I started farming, I started growing cotton also. Those days we had only open pollinator variety. Uh, so we had MCU5, MCU7, Varalakshmi and the such varieties, SVPR and the such varieties. Uh, from 1986 until 1999, I was growing only open pollinated variety. So I heard about uh, hybrid in the year uh, in uh, mid uh, 90s. So I decided to go for hybrid variety in the year 1999. Uh, so when BT cotton was introduced in the year 2002, uh, but however, I took up the BT cotton cultivation only in the year 2004. Let me slide. So those days, you know, was, that, that was a very nightmarish experience. Uh, so with the pole worms, uh, you all know the three pole worms, uh, uh, Helicoverpa, uh, Pink Bowl Worm, and the Spotted Bowl Worm. Besides this, uh, you have this Pedoptera. So they devastated our crop. They inflicted huge uh, economic uh, loss to the farmers. So those days we even, so uh, you can see uh, all over our field, you can see a lot of uh, bowls and squares uh, spreading like mat all over the field. We used to pick those uh, uh, bowls so that uh, uh, you know pupae don't develop. We uh, burn it. Uh, we send a lot of money on such uh, uh, agronomic practice also, uh, entomology practice also. We used to spray different kinds of uh, uh, chemicals. So we call it calendar spray. On Monday, we will spray. We will be spraying one uh, insecticide. On Tuesday, another one. On Wednesday. And by the weekend, about uh, different kinds of uh, at least two, three or four uh, insecticide. Again, we go for a combined cocktail of uh, various chemicals. So none of which had any uh, bearing on that. Uh, uh, they didn't uh, uh, control uh, these bollworms. So besides these uh, uh, chemicals, we uh, I even tried out these uh, biological controls. I used a nuclear polyhedrosis virus. Uh, besides, I used these uh, uh, you know light traps, uh, then uh, pheromones. 
i tried uh, who whatever suggestion made by uh, my fellow farmers or by the extension staffs i used to adopt it but uh, these pests are too smart and uh, uh, you know i was uh, uh, totally defeated uh, uh, like me a number of farmers were defeated rather these pests developed uh, resistance instead of these chemicals uh, you know eliminating these pests they uh, uh, they started developing resistance against all kinds of uh, insecticide so it drained all our resources i spent i, I uh, fell into a dead trap uh, i was uh, 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 you know i borrowed from uh, banks then banks refused to uh, uh, lend me then i had to go for the uh, private money lenders so that was the sad situation that was prevailing uh, in those days uh, you know prior to uh, i started growing uh, bt uh, bt cotton uh, so i was uh, rather so desperate i was in the verge of uh, giving up cotton cultivation itself so enough is enough let me not uh, grow cotton let me try some other crop so that decision i had come though cotton is a cash crop i decided uh, you know at one point of time i decided to then that next slide please yeah uh, i said uh, i started growing cotton only in the year 2004 bt cotton only in the year 2004 though bt cotton was introduced in the year 2002 i dragged my feet for about 2 uh, years Uh, be- this is because i got carried away by the false information so whenever you open a newspaper you will see all kinds of uh, misinformation false information it's very scary it is you know uh, uh, it is uh, it is scarier than some of the uh, horror movies uh, so uh, uh, cattle grazing in uh, uh, news report said that if you grow bt cotton then you cannot grow any other crop so the you know, that's all your soil would be dead Uh, all soil organisms would uh, you know would die uh, in tamil we call it mannu malara pedu uh, so that is the, that was the uh, situation uh, then uh, so if you uh, if you grow bt cotton then uh, none of the uh, uh, insects other insects uh, uh, the would uh, survive and they all would die and again the cost of uh, the uh, seed material is uh, higher and uh, is, uh, you know there is no point in uh, spending so much on the seed material next slide next slide yeah so uh, so as i said i uh, i wanted to give up cotton itself or cotton cultivation itself uh, so that was the uh, situation then fortunately for me there was a meeting organized in coimbatore uh, in 2004 in the month of february there was a meeting organized by south indian cotton association saika Uh, so there was a one session so out of uh, mere interest and i wanted to know how to control uh, these uh, boll worms coimbatore uh, is about uh, 320 kilometers from my in uh, four different buses to reach coimbatore i took a small room near the railway station still remember uh, i uh, you know i attended the meeting in the uh, in the saika uh, saika uh, uh, meeting organized by south indian cotton association fortunately for me one of them was about this uh, uh, bt cotton uh, uh, i still remember dr t m manjunath he made a presentation so I, you know i bombarded him with a lot of questions so i had i was you know fully charged with the false information i had in my i bombarded him with all kinds of questions he patiently replied all my questions uh, he said that uh, in stroke he explained everything uh, then he suggested Uh, ravichandran after the meeting ravichandran why don't you go and try at least one acre of bt cotton and uh, grow one acre of non bt cotton and you decide yourself so you make a comparative study if you feel that the bt cotton is uh, good enough for you you go for uh, bt cotton otherwise you used to uh, you know uh, keep fighting with this uh, uh, with this uh, boll worms in your own way so that is what he suggested so uh, you know uh, on my way back home i got down at kumbhagonam bought uh, 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 seed material needed for uh, bt cotton seed material for one acre and uh, bought the its non bt counterpart that is hybrid non bt counterpart hybrid 
and i have this uh, open polynet variety mcu7 so uh, initially i thought that okay uh, you know so, uh, science i trust science always so i thought uh, you know okay anyway uh, i would be making some benefit by way of uh, reduced uh, pesticide expenses but let me see how much i am able to save uh, so so to my sur- pleasant surprise i could realize much more uh, direct and indirect benefits what i had and next slide yeah so i uh, you know the, on the same day i took up the cultivation i took up the sowing of uh, uh, this uh, hybrid uh, bt cotton hybrid it's uh, non bt hybrid uh, non bt uh, version of uh, you know that uh, hybrid and uh, uh, then uh, Uh, what is the uh, what is the seed cost what is the sowing cost and the land preparation cost fertilizer and nutrient everything i meticulously plan, i you know i logged uh, so i can even share uh, with you whoever is uh, whoever wants it i can you know those days now uh, uh, mm-hmm. i have made a comparative study i made a comparative study between its i made a uh, cost benefit analysis differential cost and incremental revenue uh, next slide next slide Well, turn on video. All right. Yeah. Uh, 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 open pollinator variety and BT hybrid definitely it is uh, uh, more profitable than its uh, uh, non BT hybrid. Uh, so uh, you know. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. next yeah this one see you know i tell you uh, why bt cotton is uh, more profitable than uh, its non bt uh, hybrid counterpart so this is because in order to increase profitability this is true for all crops so we have to increase in uh, increase in yield per acre we have to reduce cost of cultivation we have to increase the unit selling price so the synergy of all these three factors uh, it results in increase in profitability let me explain how i uh, you know how i could achieve uh, uh, increase in profitability these contributing factors in the following slides next slide so actually the yield of cotton depends on the number of squares and bolls that such in the plant that we all know so we say that 120 bolls 150 squares so yield uh, which ultimately decides the uh, uh, yield potential uh again the vigor of the plant is also important see these squares and bolts uh, shed due to various biotic and abiotic stress factors the important factor that is responsible for bolt shedding is the bollworm uh, so again bt cotton the bolt shedding is practically nil it is non existent so uh, because uh, the in bt cotton the bolt retention rate is uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, relatively higher so which ultimately translates in higher yield Uh, so again uh, the plant must enjoy unhindered uh, vigor right from the day we so start uh, you know uh, we start uh, sowing it so again uh, the spotted bollworm first it damages the uh, tender fruit portion uh, when the plant is about 25 days old then it uh, restricts its growth so in bt cotton this is not going to happen so the the plant enjoys unhindered vigor right from the day we sow and the bolt retention rate of uh, relatively higher which ultimately translates into higher yield this is the reason for the higher yield so though bt cotton is not meant to increase the yield uh, because of the uh, you know restriction of uh, because of the absence of these bollworms uh, the yield increases next slide next slide yeah so this is by uh, uh, cotton you can see number of uh, uh, you know robust bolls next one next yeah this is a fluffy cotton next all taken by form uh, this is me standing in the barbadens variety so this is uh, i am uh, standing in front of the uh, my cotton stock in the mandi next slide again so the next point is cost reduction 
So as I said earlier, there is a, a tremendous savings uh, in terms of uh, pesticide uh, uh, cost. So major cost of uh, uh, pesticide as well as spraying cost. So there's, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, the, I could uh, save enormous quantity of uh, enormous money by way of uh, reduced uh, pesticide expenses. I had to spray only uh, one or two sprays only to control the sucking pest. Uh, then uh, again, uh, in uh, open pollinated variety, we, you, we maintain a spacing of two feet by one feet. That means we have to nurture about 22,500 plants per acre. So whereas in BT cotton or hybrid cotton, so which is non-BT, if it is hybrid, in India, we have only uh, this trait only in hybrids. Uh, so the spacing is uh, three feet by three feet or some uh, wherever the land uh, quality is good, we maintain four feet by three feet. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, the cost of uh, uh, sowing and the cost of placement of fertilizer, it's relatively low in uh, hybrids than it's open pollinator, uh, uh, open pollinator variety. And uh, see, since we are leaving a gap of uh, uh, three feet, we can use the power tiller for the intercultural operation. Uh, again, the harvest labor efficiency also increases because you know I have experience. So I used to pick along with my uh, farm hands. Uh, I, I also work with them. Uh, so I, when I, whenever I pick cotton from the uh, open pollinator and non-BT uh, cotton those, those days, so because of the bollworms, it is very difficult to pull the uh, 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 pull the kapas. Uh, it is very difficult. I made a time and motion study. So because, uh, you know, in uh, BT cotton, the, the bowls open fully. It is easier for the uh, uh, farm hands to pick uh, uh, harvesting labors to pick cotton. So the labor efficiency also increases uh, because of the absence of uh, bowl worms. Next. Next slide. So, uh, you know, this is my form, and uh, so this is my power tiller. So, I uh, use this power tiller between rows. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Next slide. So, you can see on the left side, uh, the cotton affected by the, uh, 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 you know, ball worms, and you can see uh, fluffy cotton. So I said, uh, so you, you one may ask, uh, so how come uh, the BT cotton fetches better price? Because the cotton seed, as we all know, it is an oil seed. So it secretes oil. Uh, uh, when the, 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 uh, the, the bull worms, they uh, damage the bur uh, seed also. So it secretes oil, it contaminates. The, so the uh, traders uh, buy only the pure cotton, uh, contamination oil, contam free, uh, cotton free from uh, oil contamination. So again, through these uh, entry and exit points, uh, fungus and bacteria enter and damage the uh, uh, you know, fiber. So the Ginners and uh, Millers, uh, without mentioning that it is BT cotton, those days they offered me the better price than its uh, non-BT counterpart. Those days in 2004, I used to take uh, both uh, BT as well as non-BT cotton. They used to offer me better price for my BT cotton without mentioning that it is BT cotton because of its uh, yes, they provided uh, uh, extra, uh, you know, uh, 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 extra money for my uh, cotton crop. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, there are other benefits. Uh, so uh, Professor also, uh, Dr. Mai also mentioned uh, non-target. Since we refrain from a spraying any insecticide, the non-target preserved. Ladybird beetles, you can see it's uh, fluttering all over. Uh, you can see honeybees. Uh, the environment is not polluted. Those days, if you uh, if you had you entered my field, uh, entered any village, a cotton uh, growing village, uh, you will be welcomed with the booming noise of these uh, uh, sprayers and the pungent smells of uh, smell of uh, different kinds of uh, insecticide. So you can imagine how it would happen, how it would affect the lung during the COVID uh, season. This is the uh, you know this is the environment benefit. And uh, again, the labor efficiency increase. And uh, again, uh, the, uh, both for the farmers as well as the industry, there is a win-win situation. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next one. Next one. Next, yeah. And there are, you know, uh, I mentioned uh, that I was carried away by these uh, bits. So this is a common sight in any village. You can see cows and uh, buffaloes and other uh, uh, cattle, they graze in the cotton field. So uh, there was, whenever you opened 
the uh, hundreds of uh, kinds of uh, cows died by grazing in the cotton field some veterinary doctor gave some uh, kind of uh, uh, certificate that uh, he made an autopsy and said that uh, they died because of uh, is in our cotton field this is the common site next slide next slide please next slide yeah so uh, so this lady uh, she is uh, done with the uh, harvest she is uh, uh, you know uh, grazing her uh, cattle and uh, these goats uh, they uh, you know they enjoy the uh, they prey on this uh, uh, they enjoy the uh, delicacy of uh, bt uh, plant next slide next slide again oh, so this is one important uh, uh, observation so this is uh, my cotton field uh, this uh, my farm uh, laborer uh, you know i asked him to uh, dig in the in the cotton field and i asked him to pick out the uh, earthworms he is you know on the on this side you can see this uh, uh, on the right hand side you can see the earthworms lot of earthworms so see this is bt is a soil based uh, soil based uh, organism if it is really harmful except this bt no other organism would survive in the soil it's harmless so it is uh, you know uh, 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 this is uh, uh, another uh, uh, fearful story that uh, these uh, uh, some of the activists were spreading around next slide next slide please Uh, again uh, so this is sent by my friend from maharashtra so the uh, so you can see the honeycomb this is a honeycomb uh, in his cotton field so you can see a lot of uh, honey bees since we refrain from spraying in insecticide we don't drive away the honey bees the pollination takes place uh, very well in our my uh, cotton uh, uh, cotton field uh, next slide See, actually, uh, so we, uh, for unfortunately, fortunately for the cotton farmers, and unfortunately for uh, for the rest of the farmers, uh, so uh, except cotton, we do not have any other uh, uh, trait incorporated GM crop in India. Uh, so uh, we are fighting for uh, right now. Uh, we are facing uh, some kind of uh, 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 some parts of uh, Andhra Pradesh. They are have facing uh, uh, flood condition and some places a uh, drought. We need the flood tolerant and. Uh, and uh, 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 we need to have a more nutritious crop recently in the uh, red in us uh, that is uh, uh, you know uh, innovated by uh, one doctor uh, ratur or uh, ratur an indian scientist uh, so fda has uh, approved it uh, we need to see uh, even more nutrition by growing cotton uh, next slide See, see, all, all, all sectors of the society they enjoy the benefits of science and technology. We are denied of uh, the technology. So whenever we want to use technology, then again, uh, so I'm an uh, insulin. I'm a, I'm a uh, insulin dependent. I take insulin shots. Uh, thank God these activists don't object to the uh, insulin because some bacteria produces insulin. It is cheaper for a farmer. It is cheaper for uh, putting that uh, humulene. so uh, you know that, uh, you know uh, fortunately they didn't uh, touch upon uh, the uh, himalayan so far uh, so other uh, industries which are the technology why not the farmers so we have gm mustard and uh, gm make plants uh, so these are all uh, the needs of the farmers and uh, so uh, our uh, prime minister uh, uh, late prime minister uh, pandit jawaharlal nehru used to say dr ms swamnathan used to quote that everything else can wait but not agriculture unfortunately in india agriculture be it the agriculture is or made to wait forever and uh, technology is or in the cold storage forever this uh, uh, this situation must change thank you thank you very much uh, mr avichandran that was very um forceful and passionate message coming from the heart of a farmer who has seen uh, the prior period and also the 
subsequent period of introduction of the technology because i know i know i used to i was in the pesticide industry 25 years back 30 years back and i know how for cotton farmers used to spray pesticides 20 25 30 times in the field just to control the boll worm and uh, so i think you brought out all that very well you also brought out all the information you know i remember when the gas stove came for the first time in the late 60s there was a, an information spread that if you cook on the gas it will cause harm uh, harm to your health you know the food will uh, uh, cause harm to your health so those kind of things do come whenever new technology comes i think some kind of um, um, you know um, information is spread like that but i think uh, we have to um, take into account the final product considering everything uh, through self uh, um, experience as a farmer what you have seen what you have felt i think these are all important things thank you for bringing out all these things you brought out how yields went up how price went up and how costs came down i think uh, this is a very simple formula actually to improve profit so you improve yield improve price and reduce cost i think you have uh, done that so thank you very much for bringing out uh, and also all the beneficial insects protected anebes protected and um, all that so i think it is a very a very nice presentation thank you very much so now we will uh, try to address some of the questions um, um, which have been coming so one of the um, uh, question says that uh, uh excuse me uh, ram can we go for poll number 2 please okay all right yeah so so there is a poll again so please look at uh, the questions and then uh, answer them poll has ended uh these are the results almost one minute impacts of gm crops are consistent and well documented in peer reviewed studies so 80% are saying true 9% are saying false, 11% are saying not sure. Okay. All right. So let's go to the questions. Uh, there are a few questions which uh, we can try to answer. So one of the questions I think um, which has come is that uh, I think Mr. Ravichandran answered this in his presentation, but it was still there. How come the cost of land preparation and fertilizer cost are higher in the varieties, non-BT varieties, compared to BT cotton hybrids? Uh, I think you explained that uh, with the spacing and the number of plants and then the yeah. fertilizer replacement costs and all yep. that. Okay. There is a question about uh, what are the associated risks of consuming BT cotton oil? Um, can Dr. Bansal answer that? Are there any associated risks? Are there, yes, any there, are, there are absolutely no associated risk. As I felt, it is every. It has become almost a part in Gujarat. You will find cotton seed oil is regularly consumed. And what is there is the already an association. They is called as All India Association for Cotton Crushers Association. And the head office is in Maharashtra, Bombay. So every year there are people who are now crushing oil. So mainly because they are removing gossip all, which was the earlier problem and gossip all. Now there is a technology also which has come in US where we are producing gossip all free cotton seed. But that will take time. But till then, chemically, we are removing it here in India and the oil is available everywhere. It is also available as for okay. mixing with standard oil. Thank you. And, 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 and by the way, sir, whether it, whether it is I BT or not, uh, you know, uh, so the gossip all is going to be there. So uh, even in BG, non BT cotton, the gossip oil is going to be there. No, we've been oil, which is being imported to our country, India, and we have been consuming it. It's also an oil. In fact, um, it's a GM oil. And we have no such, in real, truly speaking, that it has got any ill effect or any adverse effect on human health at all. Okay. 
So there is another question. Five million tons of soybean oil is being imported in this country. Five yes. million tons. It is GM oh. oil. Yeah. Yeah. Already there it is. is another... Yeah. Sure, sir. And Thank also you. canola. Yeah. Canola. Yeah. Thank you. There is another question to the scientists. I think between Dr. Mai and Dr. Bansal, you can look at this. The effect on native gene pool due to the introduction of transgenes is not discussed much. Uh, is there any effect on the native gene pool? Um, there is no effect at all. And please don't say that it's not been discussed much. You know, there's a lot of literature available on it. You know, truly speaking, as a scientist, I can tell you, there are examples, even with the use of BT cotton in our own country, you know, the biodiversity has increased. So people are talking about the transferring of genes horizontally or otherwise to related and wild species, and it would probably destroy the agrobiodiversity. There's no such case at all. So, but there was a lot of hue and cry when we talk about BT bringer in our country. You know, first of all, we must look into the geographical area where that particular GM crop is going to be released, whether there are any wild species around in that region at all or not. If there are no wild species entering at all, there's nothing to worry about. But even otherwise, like we have some wild species in India, you know, of, of, of brinjal, but they cannot be crossed so easily, even by human intervention. Even if scientists want them to cross, it's very difficult to get the seed. Even if we get that F1 seed, at times it's not even fertile. I mean, it's not viable. It won't even, you know, kind of germinate. So, so therefore, there is no such report that we can talk about it, particularly with regard to GM crops. Though there are otherwise hybrids being produced, conventionally bred crops are there, and we have not seen any such effect, you know, of horizontal gene transfer, you talk about it, or even otherwise from one crop species to another crop species, okay. such effect. Thank Nature takes care of itself. Thank you, sir. There was a Thank question uh, which uh, someone asked about uh, Maharashtra farmers got benefited, but Punjab farmers did not get benefited. So I think uh, I'm reading out the yield data between 2002 and 2013. Punjab uh, has seen 149% increase in yields. Haryana has seen 145% increase in yields in cotton. Whereas in Maharashtra, it is 125% increase in yields. So I think there is a cons considerable increase in the yields of Punjab and uh, Haryana also. In fact, higher than the yield increases in Maharashtra. Uh, so another question is that uh, um, why, how come we are not uh, being allowed to have iron and vitamin enriched rice in India? In the golden rice, sir, it's your uh, project. So, golden what rice, is, I, what is coming in the I way heard, of golden rice in it? No, in fact, uh, I can tell you something about golden rice. We had one event of golden rice, you know, as a donor to transfer this, you know, beta carotene content into our Indian varieties. And that was supposed to be done by four different institutions, including some state agriculture universities and institutions of, you know, ICR, even IARI. And that back crossing was done. In fact, you know, to attain homozygosity, it is important, you know, in any crop for that matter, when you do back cross bidding. To, but then if you obtain homozygosity, which we did in case of Swarna, you know, Dr. A.K. Singh, who is currently the director, he did all that work. And that there was some kind of a problem, actually, in the sense, the panicle was not able to emerge it out thoroughly in those lines. So also, this adds into the kind of fact that scientists are themselves more concerned about that no such product, if it is not useful for the farmers enough or for the consumers, will never come out of it. So there was some little issue, technical issue, that the gene of, for you know, that beta carotene content in the donor species was disturbing an auxin biosynthesis gene. I mean, any other gene which was you know, which will help otherwise in promoting plant growth and development, particularly the ear coming out, you know, and, and elongating it enough as it happens in normal rice. So there was little problem, you know, and technically this has been published in some of the very good scientists, including okay. Professor okay. Okay. from the university. So therefore there was a problem. But yes, iron rice, they are being developed. They are also in, in the pipeline and, and they are the R&D stage for sure. Dr. Sopandatta is laboratory in Kolkata University. Okay. Another question, sir, is that why hasn't any other new gene source identified to provide a choice to farmers? This is about Bt cotton. Why there was only one source of Bt gene and now other source was offered to the no, farmers? Other sources also the vegetatively induced proteins, big proteins, there are certain proteins inhibitors, etc., etc. But we don't have to worry too much about any other source as long as we get 100% protection with a single gene. And there, those genes are not single one gene. There are different classes of genes. You know, they are for different insects specific to different insects. You know, not the same gene 
work. If there is an insect, it's lepidopteron type, there's a different gene. If it is another class, polypteron, this is a different gene. So for different classes of insects... No, I, think, are... I think the question was about Bt cotton. I think there were five sources think... approved in India by GSA. GSA approved five yeah, sources. Already of BT. Yeah, already yeah. 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 approved six events. Six events, yeah, yeah. correct. So they were available in the market. It is just that the farmers chose to grow only one of them. Matter of, because uh, some of the good variety, hybrids, they are already having the normal uh, BG2. That's why it is popular. Okay. There is another question. Any other sir, question? Perhaps, uh, perhaps Graham or anyone else can answer this. The question is that why Burkina Faso stopped BT cotton? All right. Yes. Um, in Burkina Faso, the, there has been a temporary stop on growing GM cotton, uh, and that's actually nothing to do with the, the technology. It was due to difficulties that the farmers had in selling the cotton from the varieties that the technology was in, because the fibres are shorter than what uh, the cotton users in the markets in West Africa particularly want. So the government decided to stop the approval for growing the GM varieties until the technology was back crossed into varieties that have longer fibres. And that will result in, I think, possibly next year, the reapproval of the technology in um, Burkina Faso. I know certainly that the area and the production of cotton in the country has gone down quite a lot since the ban was introduced, but it, um, it will be reapproved once it's in um, varieties with longer fibres. Okay. So I think there what you are saying... Yeah. 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 Hello. No. I had yeah, Dr. Mai, Burkina please. Faso. Yeah. 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 Burkina, the basic uh, what Graham says is right. It, is, it was the issue of really backcrossing to the local uh, varieties which were not suitable, and that's why they were rejected in the market. But now, because the people have realized that they have lot of problems because there is already uh, an outbreak of uh, the bollworms there sometimes. So now they are coming back. So there is a lot of improvement going on. Okay. We are of uh, African Biosafety Committee there. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Bansal, this question is addressed to you specifically. What are the evidences that GM mustard trials were conducted as per AACRP protocol? Um, was it... Uh, what, what are the evidence that GM mustard trials were conducted as per AACRP protocols? In fact, I, most of the protocol was not followed, including correct check was not used. HT GM hybrid mustard was not compared with hybrid. No, HT mustard, actually speaking, is not something to be compared with here. There's no, we're not talking of herbicide tolerance in the GM mustard at all. GM, the herbicide gene is only used to select out those transgenics compared to the non-transformed cells. And, and it is only utilized it's only utilized for the product, seed production point of view. So let's not please talk about compare. Here, the herbicide tolerant trait we're talking about in this GM mustard hybrid developed by Professor Deepak. Here, it's only Barnes and Barstar kind of a combination of genes which will kill the pollen. Barnes will kill the pollen. It will make plant for male sterile. Barney, bar star will restore the pollen fertility and those two lines combined and there's a whole procedure of hybrid seed production and hybrid seed only will be sold to, to the farmers. So point here is that let's not compare with that. And otherwise I have myself monitored. I was a member and involved as a member of a committee, a subcommittee of the APEX body, GEAC. And I have myself visited those actually speaking. You know, so so whatever the procedure has been all followed, I would say this, you know, in, in all Thank these. You. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mai, this is for you. Uh, what is the future of HTBT yeah. cotton in India? What do you think will be the future of HTBT cotton in India? You see, uh, there is a big organization called the Shetkari Sangatna. They have openly uh, already uh, planted 
and they have celebrated also that we are going to plant it kindly come and arrest us nothing has happened because the high court has stopped everything what i feel is if this situation you see there is a one danger in this the danger is because all the seed is coming either from telangana or gujarat and they don't give any receipt i am only worried because i have been warning them that you will be cheated after some time and there may not be any kind of hd or bt genes in them but then what will you do they say now we are sure that we will get it and they are also putting lot of pressure on the government maharashtra government has already uh, this year said okay you go ahead they did not uh, object to it so it appears that uh, there is a uh, case pending with the minister of environment and uh, minister of environment wants to call back probably buyer or uh, maiko whether they can revise the application and all this so it's a very long run okay. process but i am happy okay. that the pressure is being put on okay thank you one final question i think uh, we have already overshot the time so uh, we'll take this last question what is the current scenario and potential of gn edited crops in india um i think this um gn edited crop work is already in progress in india in several labs you know it started with banana transformation in one of the agricultural biotechnology institute of uh, dbt at mohali then genome edited rice with one of the drought stress tolerant gene you know by dr vishwanathan at iri new delhi you know where they have shown that there is a remarkable increase in in drought tolerance in fact in those plants because these are the products where in a single gene could be mutated as a loss of function and loss of function gives you some kind of an advantage of, of plant growth and icgb people are working in fact and, and dbt is taking a lot of interest in in fact in having this program genome edited crops in the country guidelines are being developed which are being discussed at the gac level at the moment and uh, i believe there is a good scenario looking forward to on genome edited crops in our country but the only thing is you know as a recommendation of this particular webinar if there is any we must try to recommend that the kind of mistakes if i may say we have done in india for example with regard to the adoption of gm technology which is so good a technology is world over people have seen it we should be rather fair enough with this technology which is more precise more accurate cost effective more efficient genome gene genome edited technology must be utilized you know the way it should be actually benefit of farmers crisat is also doing crisat is also having a program on gene editing so yeah. there are a lot of institutions yeah and now i have already written it, uh, dr bansal i have written it to a nas nas should really conduct a program of brainstorming on genome editing now right no genome editing have, so we did we did yeah, yeah, we are document yeah, yeah. Okay. no that draft guidelines are there, but the guide, final guidelines have not come it is only under draft stage so that is another pending issue and yeah. therefore i am asking yeah. us now i you really I have a brain problem yeah i am looking okay thank you sir thank you all very much for answering all the questions i think it was a great uh, discussion excellent presentations followed by some very straight answers to some of the tough questions about the technology uh, we do appreciate all of that very much so we will uh, before we go to vote of thanks and the summary by dr mahalakshmi uh, arujanan uh, who is a global coordinator of isa before that we will have the third poll right there is a webinar poll yeah the questions are here please question is here please answer this what topic on crop biotech would you like to know more about safe food safety environmental issues health issues new products labeling coexistence of gm and organic international trade So here are the results. Uh, 
28% said coexistence of GM and organic crops. They would like to understand more. 26% said environmental issues. 28% said health issues and concerns. 18% said food safety. 24% asked for information. Sorry, 16%. Sorry, I was reading the 16% asked for new products. 19% asked for health issues. 17% asked for environmental issues. 12% asked for food safety. 28% asked for coexistence of GM and organic crops. And 5% asked for international trade. Thank you. So that gives us an indication of what are the subjects to be addressed in perhaps some of the future webinars. Uh, thank you very much. So that brings us to the end. I now request uh, Mahalakshmi Arjanan, Global Coordinator of ISA, to summarize, uh, to wrap up, and give a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Ram. I think you have done a very good summary after each um, speaker, so I don't think I need to do that, but just a word of thanks. Um, so to everyone, Vanakam, Namaste, and Namaskar. On behalf of AISA, I would like to thank Alliance of Agri-Innovation for hosting this webinar, and our partner, Federation of Seed Industry of India, for your support. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ram, for moderating this session very well. Uh, you did uh, such a great job. And I think this is one of the uh, very rich discussion that we saw. In fact, I'm looking at this discussion and I see the hunger for technology as well as a lot of questions that need to be answered. Um, and of course, thank you uh, to our esteemed speakers, Dr. Graham Brooks, Dr. Sidi Mai, a strong partner of AISA, Dr. Bansal, and my very good friend, farmer friend, Mr. David Chandran. All of uh, you, in fact, have been um, long-time partners uh, of AISA. Just like AISA's data on global status of commercialized biotech crops, Dr. Brooks' data on socioeconomic impact of biotech crops helps many key stakeholders around the world to make informed decisions on the approval and adoption of biotech crops. Socioeconomic impact is a contentious topic, and I am a, de a regular delegate to COPMOP meetings, which is organized by Convention on Biological Diversity. And this is very much discussed in those meetings. And Dr. Brooks' data sheds a lot of light in this topic, together, of course, with all the other speakers. Um, India is definitely a, a key agri producer in the world. And there is so much of innovation in the pipeline with many GM crops waiting to reach the farm. I wanted to say more than a dozen. And from Dr. Uh, I think it was Bansal's uh, presentation, I saw that there are 23 crops that has been developed and many other trades as well, 60 plus trades. And uh, many of them are almost at the tail end of R&D. So what we need here is a political will public awareness for crops to be approved and adopted. And this is where AISA plays a key role in uh, facilitating transfer of knowledge and engaging various key stakeholders. Dr. Brooks' data and information and uh, uh, information from other uh, speakers clearly show the socioeconomic benefits of biotech crops. And um, I'm glad that gene editing was also brought up in the discussion. These are the new tools that's going to open many more doors, especially to developing countries as um, this is where public sectors and small enterprises will be able to be players uh, because all this while we've been seeing multinational companies. Uh, these NBTs or new breeding technologies will create more technopreneurs among our young graduates and both uh, GM technology and NBT together with conventional breeding techniques will all serve to address climate change, food, nutrition, security, job creations, and more importantly, ensuring that all these are done sustainably. I personally think it's not just about feeding the world. We have been talking about feeding the world. We have been talking about food availability. But what goes to my uh, heart also as a teacher in the university is that the newer challenges are getting young farmers to take up agriculture as a profession. And, um, and this clearly shows that uh, GM technology is a key addition to the current toolkit that we can no longer uh, ignore. Looking at all this positive data, AISA is confident that we can, we are on the right track in supporting developing countries to embrace green technologies for crop development. We will continue to do with our outreach program in India everywhere and capacity building programs and even uh, new approaches to achieve our objectives. So with this, I'm wishing India all the best and please continue your good work. We need a leader among developing countries for innovation in agriculture and India certainly is a potential candidate. My last message is for the critics of GM technologies. Please speak to the farmers before you speak for them. Farmers like Mr. Rao Chandran are asking for more biotech crops to be developed, approved, and adopted. Let us support them. 
So with that, thank you very much, Nandri and Danyawad. Thank you. Thank you very much for your message from Malaysia. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much to our panelists, Graham, Dr. Thank Mari, you. and Thank you, Ravi. Yeah. Thank you. I will email you all. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.